Well, Derek, welcome. It's great to see you. I know you're impressed because you just met a real celebrity, Stefan Bonsell from Moderna. Yeah, I did. Um, and I uh, left my vaccine card with Jody backstage. I got a Moderna vaccine. I want him to autograph that card. Great. Well, the COVID Hall of Fame, right? Right here at uh, Health. Anyway, as I say, it's great to see you. We first met a number of years ago. You were running OptumRx, the Optum PBM at the time, Pharmacy Benefit Management Company. And that was not too long after you had joined UHG from your prior career, which was running airport operations for Northwest Airlines. Since you've gotten to UHG, you've seen this amazing growth in the company. The company is now a Fortune 5 company, not 50, not 500, but five. Eighth biggest company in the world, biggest private payer in the United States. Uh, 340,000 employees of whom now more than a third are clinical professionals. Mm -hmm. So just an amazing reinvention of this company alongside phenomenal growth in the period of time you've been there. How has it been from your perspective seeing this evolution at the company? Oh, good. No, yeah, the, you have all the statistics right. So um, first I'll take it and what I've seen with the company and how the company's changed, and then I'll give you a little bit on my perspective and my view of the healthcare, healthcare landscape. So, you know, the, the company back in 2003 when I started had $30 billion worth of revenue. Um, as I, we sit here today in the third quarter alone, we just reported our earnings, um, it was $72 billion. So, you know, nearly a tenfold increase. So that, that fairly... In, fairly great growth. Um, but you know, what really is the main difference is if you look, we were largely a benefits company, um, largely commercial insurance, um, but we've really evolved to the point now where actually more of the earnings are driven by our services arm than our benefits arm. And the two biggest changes I would say were the, the pharmacy services company, OptumRx, and the Optum Care, uh, our Optum Care division. Um, our pharmacy services company, we started out, you know, acquiring Pacific Care prescription solutions, sort of the PBM came along with it. Then Part D blew up. Then we insourced Medco. Then we acquired Catamaran and voila, now we have this big pharmacy services company. It was just scary to think about when we first uh, did the diligence on prescription solutions, the questions we asked were pretty novice oriented. So, you know, I think it's one of these situations where sometimes you find the business and sometimes the business finds you. I think pharmacy care services found us. And then I, I think our Optum Care, um, 100,000, you know, if you look at our 60,000 physicians and uh, either employed or affiliated, um, you know, I think that has the, the greatest chance to improve healthcare. You know, the way we can um, align payer and provider sort of um, incentives. It's, it's really important to be able to do that. Better outcomes, lower costs, better experience. And I think Optum Care really is the cornerstone of our organization sort of as we pave forward. So a, a real big morph from benefits to services over the years. Um, you asked me about my view. I, I, what I get to see is, is things like, when I talk to big national employers, they say things like, look, we need, we need help with behavioral health. We need solutions there. We need help with especially drug affordability. You know, I get to take those things back to the services arm and say, hey, Optum, what are you doing about that? We got to improve in these offerings. And get to talk to hospitals and they say, hey, we have problems with revenue cycle management. All right, what are we doing to improve that? So I, I get to sort of be a, 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 an air traffic controller to use the old business and determine solutions across our enterprise for things that I hear about in the market. That's really extraordinary. So what's more complicated, running airport operations for a major carrier or managing healthcare? Um, well, first of all, healthcare is more complicated, but you don't have the weather to deal with. <laughs> some, some slight redeeming difference. Well, you're obviously beginning to talk about the challenges that we face in healthcare, as we have for quite some time. Affordability, access, quality of care. And obviously the pandemic, and this has been a theme throughout this conference, has highlighted challenges in all of those three domains. Mm -hmm. As we start to move out of the pandemic, uh, so here you are, the company that you just described, big, big provider of care, direct provider of care, big financer, financier, if you will, of care. Mm -hmm. uh, just an enormous, uh, set of fingers in the healthcare system that the company has. As we are moving out of the pandemic and seeing beyond the pandemic, 
how does the world appear to UHG at this point? And what do you think are the opportunities as well as the most important ch challenges as we move out of the public health emergency? Yeah, well, I, I think about, you know, big, um, you know, big events, global issues. And, you know, when I was in the airline business um, after 9-11, there was a real sense of urgency for everybody in that business to make air travel safer. As we come out of the pandemic, I get a real sense of urgency within our company and throughout healthcare in general to make it better, right? And I think what, I, what you saw during the pandemic was fee-for-service, the warts of fee-for-services arrangements showed really, really clearly. And so I think there's a real push to value. And as I look across the landscape today, what I see is Medicare Advantage is probably the best place where you see value being driven. Um, a lot of identification of, of, uh, of care gaps up front, being able to solve those early is really important. And as I look at sort of that model and Medicare Advantage versus Medicare fee for service, you see between the government's cost and the consumer's cost, you see 12% less than fee for service. You see 20% more preventative visits occurring. You see beneficiary costs actually 40% less. Um, and you see really a lot of differing and you see less uh, emergency room visits, you see less inpatient admits. So really better outcomes, lower cost, right? Uh, and actually a better patient experience because there's a 98% satisfaction. So you look at that and you say, what, what are the attributes of that? And, and I think one key thing that's emerged is the capitation arrangements between, um, you know, for example, Optum Care has 2 million people under fully capitated arrangements. And what that means is they take risk on the outcomes as well as, as, well as the cost. And that type of arrangement drives the right incentives and the right value in the system. And I, I think Medicare Advantage has sort of led healthcare in that way. And I'd like to see us get there with commercial insurance. Um, commercial insurance, very expensive. To be able to, again, align those incentives in the system, we think is very important. The, um, there are huge swaths of the U.S. healthcare system that are still stuck firmly in fee-for-service with no intention of moving out of it. How do you think you can basically be a force to really push the change farther and faster than might have been thought even a year ago? Yeah, I, I think all parts of the system have to, to compromise a little bit. I think from a from a delivery standpoint and from a, a payer standpoint, the ability to sort of ease into it a little bit. I mean, you're not gonna rip the Band-Aid off and say, hey, we're gonna go from a fee-for-service world without structural changes. And the, the real thing is making sure there's an alignment of what people wanna do. And there's gotta be a lot of flexibility on both sides. That's what I think. So earlier today, Marcus Osborne from Walmart said the number one pain point for consumers in this country is the cost of healthcare. Do you agree? And what do you think Optum and UHG in the short run can do about it. Yeah, I think that, yes, I, I do agree that uh, the cost of healthcare is, the, is number one on the agenda. I mean, we, we drive from an insurance perspective a lot of product attributes. But I would say the most important attribute that we drive is the ability to have it be more affordable. Affordability drives access, and that's what people need, right? So um, every week, there's a, a, the commercial insurance division at United has an affordability meeting. They talk about, you know, what's the right site of service? You know, how can we get people to the right and most effective site of service? How can you get, um, how can we improve payment integrity? How can we improve the administrative aspects of care? Um, all those things are really important to be able to make sure that we drive affordability. So one of the other big forces that the pandemic uh, unleashed and fanned forward was the movement of care outside of conventional institutional settings, hospitals in particular, to the home, to communities, et cetera. Obviously that was a trend that was underway for quite some time, but the pandemic really, really accelerated it. How are you seeing this movement? I know that Op Optum Care, for example, uh, is thinking about delivery of care as much as possible to consumers in their homes. How do you see that world evolving and what are the assets you're gonna to bring to bear in this movement? Yeah, I think there's, there's two things. I think if you look at the main secular trends that emerged, um, were one virtual and two home, right? Um, why, why do those make sense? It's what consumers want. I mean, that's really important. So um, I actually talked on our earnings call last week about moving virtual from version one to version two. Version one being seen, point treatment. 
to version two, which basically says, hey, look, um, and as a matter of fact, United, United and Optimer have developed a product called Navigant Now, which will roll out throughout um, at, at, at the end of this year. And what it is, it's a virtual first product. It has an Optum Care, primary care physician, backed up by um, uh, potentially a, backed up by either A, an urgent care or a behavioral specialist or a physical primary care physician it needed, all backed up by the United Healthcare Network. And we think these products will be 15% less than traditional products in the market. So we're trying to take a more holistic approach than virtu with virtual as time has moved on. So I would also say home is this, the second piece. And so Optum has um, been investing in home for a long time. So our house calls program, where our nurses go and visit um, our beneficiaries in the houses and our patients in their homes, they do uh, clinical care inventories. What they do is they identify gaps in care, ref either close those gaps themselves or refer to primary care. Uh, we also have established a, a post-acute capability to help people transition to home from an acute environment. Also, we've developed a, a capability whereby we can have actual docs go into homes and actually coordinate care for people who have the most chronic of conditions. Um, you know, and then lastly, uh, a lot of technology deployed to be able to take sensing from uh, you know, whatever device a, pa a patient has to be able to understand whether it be a scale or something like that to determine whether weight's going up, um, to make sure that we can intervene where necessary and where appropriate when someone's having a problem. So uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the notion of Optum at home and a lot of the notion of virtual, trying to get to a spot where it's convenient for the consumer and actually provides more access. So hearkening back to your days at Optum RX, you're also innovating on the specialty pharmacy front particularly around Optum Frontier Therapy. Talk about that. What's it aimed at? What are you trying to accomplish? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've established, so, um, you know, Optum RX is not just a PBM anymore. You know, there's an infusion business, there's, a, and that's big. And there's also a community pharmacy business. But the most uh, recent that we've established is Optum Frontier Therapies. And what they're involved with is trying to uh, tr help with the facilitation of rare and genetic conditions. And so we work with pharma manufacturers and we're trying to ultimately show the value of some of these therapies. Um, we wanna understand how they drive ultimately better, uh, better outcomes and better experiences for patients. So bringing the data together, bringing the tools together to prove out um, the efficacy of, of uh, new therapies that are coming to market is a really important objective of Optum Frontier. And I know the attempt is really to co-produce a new model of care delivery for people with these special, with these rare disease conditions. What does that mean? How, do, how, how is the company thinking about working with people to invent the new modes of care delivery? Well, I, I just, you know, I, I just think it's a matter of working, like you just said, working with people, making sure, again, I think our best ability is to sort of pull together data sets and to be able to say, hey, this particular therapy is working and here's how it's, how effective it is. Make sure we're tracking all the aspects of that particular therapy. So it's really bringing a set of tools together to make sure we optimize therapies to outcomes. So another huge uh, need that the pandemic clearly exposed was behavioral and mental health. I think Ken Frazier said yesterday that uh, he had seen some statistics about depression and anxiety multiplying three or four times over the course of the year of the pandemic. What do you tell, let's talk a bit about that, the challenges that are now being addressed. There's the pandemic within the pandemic of this behavioral health. There's the pandemic after the pandemic, as some are calling it around long COVID and all the neuropsychiatric conditions that people suffering from long COVID can experience. How are you gonna to rise to meet those challenges? Yeah, well, I, I think with respect to behavioral health, first of all, I'm happy that, you know, the stigma has been reduced. People are actually seeking behavioral care at a greater rate, which is great from my perspective um, and everybody's perspective. Um, seven in 10 people with behavioral conditions also have medical conditions associated with those. And the biggest 
one of the big issues, again, is access. I mean, I used to get a lot of emails, and the emails would say, you know, I, I can't get access to, a, a, to a, a behavioral health doc when I need to. And it was particularly uh, bad with respect to kids. You know, parents, I'd get emails from parents that said, hey, look, the only option I have is to go to, you know, the ER. And, you know, Optum slash United had, has the biggest behavioral health physical network in, in the country and still wasn't enough. So one of the things that has evolved is that, you know, 50 to 60% of the visits now with behavioral health are done in some virtual form. That's really stuck as, the, you know, throughout the pandemic. So one of the things United and Optum have done is we've um, invested in Able2 and Synvelo. Able2 is a virtual capability for behavioral and Synvelo is more of a, a text-based solution. Those solutions are great because it provides access. So, you know, uh, again, we're trying to develop uh, tools for people to improve access and get people the care they need. I think it was Sri Shagatura said earlier today from CVS that so much of America is undoctored or underdoctored, and obviously in mental health that is true in spades. This is a solution directly aimed at that problem, correct? Oh, there's there's no doubt, and I mean, and, and like I said, it's the a huge problem was just access, and any anyone who can help with that problem is just helping healthcare. Period. Well, and to state the obvious. Another huge issue that the pandemic spotlighted, as of course did other events of last year, is health inequity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that starts with just collecting the data on race and ethnicity and demographic data, which a lot of systems still do not have. So still are not in a position really to track what is going on across populations. What's United's preeminent role in addressing health equity from your perspective? Yeah, well, um, with respect to health equity, you know, our view is, you know, health equity is, again, about access. And, you know, regardless of someone's social, environmental, or economic conditions, people need and deserve access to care. Let's start with that. I would further say that United for years has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in things like housing and food to try to make it better sort of on a, on a local basis. Um, but I think our, our biggest contribution can be when we bring the data to bear to identify the disparities and then act on them. So I think about like um, one of the things that we did is we, um, some of our data scientists went through and they found out that in Ohio and Michigan and in Hawaii, there was postpartum gaps in care. They identified that. Well, we brought assets to bear and we closed those gaps in care to the point where um, rural women in Hawaii, 40% reduction in gaps in care, African-American women in Michigan and Ohio, 11% reduction and 9% reduction respectively. So with that as a jumping board, we said, hey, we got to establish to try to scale this a little bit more broadly. What we did is we established United Healthcare Catalyst. And what that basically does, it takes a look at each, you know, many of our markets and 30-year 30, 30 markets or so and says, hey, listen, um, what can we do to attack one thing that the data says that we should go after in that market? Um, a good example of, of something that came out of that was in Akron, Ohio. Um, we found out, data told us that um, uh, emergency department visits were driven by a lot of behavioral health conditions in, in disparate populations. So what we did, again, is we brought things to bear, like housing, like a uh, hotline for uh, substance abuse, so people could call, so people could call and um, you know, talk to someone rather than have an emergency department visit. visit. So as a result of what we did in Akron, what we saw was we saw a 10% reduction in people going to the ER in these disparate communities with um, you know, related to behavioral needs. So again, bringing resources to bear to be able to provide these sort of catastrophic ED events by sort of looking at the data and saying, hey, what's going on with this particular pop population? But you know, um, if you look at health equity, I think everybody's got to chip in. Um, I think across the entire healthcare landscape, there's a lot of resources being devoted and rightfully so. And I know United and Optum are doing a lot also to address issues around bias in data as well. Make sure that there isn't inherent racial and other bias built into our data sets, mm -hmm. because frankly, our data sets reflect the world as it was, mm -hmm. right? Which was characterized by these structural inequities. Yes, so that's that's a very good point. So as, as a matter of fact, the the gentleman who, run, who runs Optum Labs, he and I had a conversation about what we're doing with respect to some of our, with our algorithms, and we actually have a group of people that check for bias and make sure we audit for that. So yes, that's something which we're very attuned to and we wanna make sure it doesn't occur.
Well, Dirk, there's a ton more we could be talking about. Uh, hospital prices, I know, uh, one, one of the issues you care a lot about, transparency, many, many other issues, but of course we're getting toward the end of our time. So let me just ask you, any final thoughts, any final words for the audience about the future of United Health Group? Yeah, look, I, I would say the, you know, what we're trying to do, I'll just go back to our, our mission statement, um, helping people live healthier lives and helping to make the health system work better for everyone. Um, I think about that as really something that we want to continue to do. And I hope through my comments tonight, you, you got that impression. It's all about lower costs, better outcomes, better patient experience. We want to do that by attacking, of course, all aspects of the healthcare system. We think we can provide a lot of integrated solutions that others can't to be able to address all those things. So yeah, that's, that's what we're all about. But we actually have a video and um, we'll cue that. And it really talks about, it shows you one of, our, um, one of our, our nurses interacting with one of our patients and our members. And I think, uh, I think you'll all find it really shows how well, we, uh, how well we're trying to operate on it actually on an individual level in an individual communities to make it work better. Great, let's roll that video now. My name's Diana Dombrowski. I'm an adult geriatric nurse practitioner with House Calls. So the whole point of House Calls is when we enter the home, we're really there to do a comprehensive health visit. Seeing a member in their home is, I always use that term, golden opportunity. It is an opportunity for us to come into an environment where they're comfortable. And oftentimes they reveal things that they may not reveal to their primary care provider. You know, are they able to understand their medications? Do they understand why they're taking them? It's like you treat them like you would want to be treated yourself or your family members. So my mom was um, 92. She passed away two years ago from advanced dementia and she lived independently. She was one that would go to her primary care provider and the plan of care was prescribing medications and then she would come home, she'd fill them, but she wouldn't take them. I think having that personal experience, it deepens your compassion. It deepens your commitment to help them. Because sometimes we go in the home and the home's not a safe environment. We might be the catalyst to get them connected with the resources to change that. I always ask a member, is it okay if I look in your cabinets? Can I look in your refrigerator freezer? And it's shocking sometimes because they can live in a very urban, dense area, but they don't have food how can you leave a member's home and not go back? So yeah, I've picked up lunch and now I carry some things in the car that are simple, some things that are like some staples and even just bottled water. And to me, that just shows compassion. I mean, as practitioners, that sets the core of who we are. It's always been putting the member first, you know, meeting those members' needs, like what needs do they have? What questions do they have? Because we want them to feel like they are driving their, their own health care. You know, it's not an easy journey. They're very caring. They, uh, you can tell that they actually care. It's just a wonderful program. There's no way to get around it. So many of the members that I see, they're my heroes. I mean, they are dealing with very tough health burdens. Having that person that represents an organization that has such vast resources and support is, that's it's transformational, it's powerful. So in the end, it's all about the people. That's absolutely right. And I, I think that showed it better than I could sum it up. Thanks for having me. Thanks everybody for all you're doing for healthcare. Great. Thanks so much, Dirk.